Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Sparks, Nevada online sermon. I'm Lori Stevens, the church administrator, and we're glad you're here. Pastor Morley's sermon this morning is from Mark 2, 23 through 3, 6. He has entitled it, When to Break Man's Sabbath Rules. I don't know if I've heard a sermon quite like this one. Pastor Morley argues from scripture that there are at times more important things to do than attending church, giving to the Lord, or even worshiping the Lord. It's full of surprises, so watch and listen to it all. I'm sure, as always, he will step on more than a few toes. Remember to share these videos with your family and friends, like and share, and if you haven't already hit that subscribe button, do it now. Thank you. Take your Bibles, the Word of God, and turn to Mark chapter 2. I've entitled this sermon, When to Break Man's Sabbath Rules. Have you ever got so caught up in rules and regulations that you lost sight of what you were doing and why? Or perhaps in keeping the rules and regulations, you forgot about love and mercy. The nation of Israel was like that. The nation got so wrapped up in the rules that they lost sight of their reason God put them here. Once we cannot see the forest for all the trees, that is, we lose sight of what is essential in life. Once we forget what is essential in life, everything we do gets messed up. When we turn following Jesus into a bunch of rules, a lot of do's and don'ts, those don'ts and do's, those rules can be used as an excuse to divide people, judge people, and look down on people, thus not seeing what is most important. We can even use societal norms in which we live to not do the right thing because those norms are the wrong norms. It can cause people who should know better to refuse to do the right thing and help others. In the 1989 film Mississippi Burning, which dealt with the horrors of racism, the social pressure to conform to racism was so great that when a white woman finally breaks down and tells a police officer about a crime she's aware of committed against a black man by white people, several people go to her house, beat her up, and destroy her property. One of those people was her own husband. What I'm saying is, not doing what is right because of fear of reprisals from your peers or even the authorities is sin. We need as Christians to stand up for what is right because it is the right thing to do. Amen. When, when society is dominated by laws and rules that meticulously lay out exactly how we are to act, even if it is sin, then you are creating a culture of fear. And that should not be. That is to feel forced to act in specific ways when it goes against the teachings of Christ. It is sin. We live in a world and a time where woke society demands that we conform to their set of rules and standards. And if you don't, then they will try and destroy you. Some say wokeism is a religion, every bit as violent and evil as Islam. Traditional values of Christianity, logic, science, and reason are replaced by emotions and subjective opinions. For example, men can have babies, white can be black, and black can be white. Little children are diagnosed as being homosexuals. Schools override parents in making medical decisions. If I owned a business here in Sparks, Nevada, and it was widely known what I believe about wokeism, systemic racism, LBGTQ movement, critical race theory, and Black Lives Matter, they would be picketing or worse, burning my business down. This is one of the main reasons we have armed men and women at all events at First Baptist Church. If we don't believe and agree with what they believe and say, then they are going to destroy us. The world Jesus entered was much like we have today in 2013 and had under COVID, in which rules and regulations governed every aspect of life, what you ate, what types of clothes you could wear whom you could be associated with, how close you could stand to another, when and where you were allowed to work. If you didn't get the jab, you lost your job. Even when you could go out of your home, and worst of all, if a loved one was dying, 
They refuse to let you be with them under the threat of being arrested. And the list goes on and on and on. What was amazing to me is some people like that even fell in love with those rules and regulations. And if you didn't conform, that it was too bad for you. Just so many people love being under the law, a law of do's and don'ts. They can't handle the freedom they have under grace. They can't think for themselves. They want others to do their thinking for them. They want others to tell them what to do and what not to do. Jesus got in trouble with people because they lost sight of what was important, what God valued. God has always been about loving people. What Jesus did on the cross for us was the ultimate example of what love looks like. Jesus was a disruptor. So unsurprisingly, he received criticism throughout his ministry. The last criticism of Jesus we're looking at in this series of sermons is found in Mark chapter 2. In Mark 2, Jesus and the disciples walked through the grain fields. And as they walked, they plucked heads of grain to eat. The Pharisees see this. And because this action is classified as work on a day when no work was to be done, they asked Jesus, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Also on the Sabbath, Jesus enters a synagogue and sees a man with a withered hand. Those sitting in the pews watch Jesus intently to see what he will do. So intense is the, their scrutiny that Jesus feels compelled to defend his actions. Mark chapter 3 verse 4. Then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. The criticism came down to the behavior of Jesus and his disciples on the sacred day known as the Sabbath. They are guilty of working on a day when no work was to be performed. Remember that Jesus never sinned. He never violated a single one of God's commands, but he did not adhere to the man-made rules and additions to God's law. The religious leaders took the simple Ten Commandments and added another 603 to those Ten Commandments for a total of 613. When you think about it, the more laws, the less freedom one enjoys. That is why many of us today want the government to stop making laws, because when they do, they infringe upon our freedoms. The 603 additions to God's law made following the Lord more of a burden and a joy. Today, we're going to focus on Mark chapter 3 as we see how Jesus once again offers us a glimpse into the heart of God. Look there at Mark 3, 1 through 3. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Now, this is a test. Before this event was recorded, Jesus had another run-in with the religious leaders when he and his disciples were walking through a grain field on the Sabbath. And his disciples were eating some of the grain in the field. And by the way, what they did was lawful. They were not stealing. The law allowed anyone to pick grain in a field to eat so long as they did not use tools to harvest the grain. The problem the religious leaders had was the timing. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Now it happened that he, Jesus, went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? It's obvious the religious leaders were out to get Jesus. But that did not stop Jesus from doing good, from doing what was right. His disciples were hungry, and Jesus did not let the man-made rules stop him from allowing them to eat. So Jesus enters the synagogue, and there is a man there with a withered hand. Mark tells us the people were watching Jesus like a hawk to see what, if anything, he would do for the man. The word watched in the Greek implies closely watching 
with sinister intent. Another way to state that thought is that the opponents of Jesus were lying in wait. By this time, the religious leaders were following Jesus, seeking ways to entrap him. We do not know why this man was there. He was there either by habit or the leaders brought the man in as bait to trap Jesus. So what would Jesus do? In the Gospels, there are several occasions when Jesus is criticized for healing on the Sabbath. Matthew chapter 3, Mark 12, Luke 6, Luke 13, John 5, John chapter 7, chapter 9. Among the Jews of Jesus' day, there were differing opinions what could be done on the Sabbath with respect to the health of humans and animals. Luke chapter 14, verse 5 indicates that even Jesus' opponents would rescue a son if he fell into a well on the Sabbath. Verse 5, then Jesus answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Other gospel passages indicate that many of them would accept watering domestic animals on the Sabbath. The withered hand was not life-threatening. So if Jesus were to heal this man, he could not claim he saved the man's life because he could have waited until the next day. Many in the crowd would have agreed with the religious leader's contention that there were six days to work, so why heal the man on the Sabbath? Jesus asked the man to stand up before the crowd. Now listen, when you are faced with a situation where doing right might cause other problems with people, what do you do? There was tremendous pressure on the people of Israel to keep all the rules, not just the Ten Commandments, but the other 603 man-made rules. Those rules put people in a mental prison. Can you imagine living that way? I was feeling that way under COVID. In our society, people who say they are for freedom seek to make more rules, to make sure you follow what they want you to do. If we do not go along with the false narratives that our government puts out and the media forces on us, we will be attacked from all sides. We saw this again with COVID during the election with Hunter's laptop. And we all remember the big lie, Russia, Russia, Russia. If we don't agree with them, then they will attack us. They will try to shut free speech down. They want us to believe what they want us to believe. That was the Pharisees. Jesus asked the man with the withered hand to stand before the crowd. Mark 3, 4. Then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or, or kill? But they kept silent. That was the question. When the man stands up, Jesus has a question he is posing to the religious leaders. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil, to save life or destroy it? Their response, they were silent. Now let's go back to Mark chapter 2, verse 25. As Jesus answers the question as to why his disciples were working on the Sabbath, Jesus points out an incident found in 1 Samuel chapter 21 when David and his men were hungry after being on the run from King Saul. And the Bible says they entered the house of God and asked for the showbread to eat. Mark 2, 25 and 26. But he, Jesus, said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? <clears throat> he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some of those, some of the, that bread to his men. The show bread was 12 loaves of bread placed before the Lord in the holy place every Sabbath. They represented the fertility of creation along with the greatness of God. The 12 loaves represented each tribe. The law commanded that the 12 loaves were fresh baked upon the Sabbath and were placed hot in two rows upon the show bread table. The loaves, when removed, were to be eaten by the priest and no one else. Now notice, no one condemned David for eating the bread when this event occurred. Now back to the question from Jesus. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil, to save life or dis destroy it? Why do you think Jesus asked this question? 
Jesus puts the question in the true light. To refuse to do good is to do evil. For sure, it would not be right to do evil on the Sabbath. The religious leaders made the Sabbath question entirely a matter of doing or not doing. Jesus made the question about doing good. His question implies that a failure to do good when one is able is harmful and sinful. In a small way, it would be like, you know you should be in church on Sunday. The Bible says, do not forsake the attending of yourselves, Hebrews 10, 24. But if you're on your way to church and you pass a little old lady with a flat tire along the road, do you stop and help her and miss church or do you go on to church? Or let's say you have your church offering in your pocket and you're on your way to church. You know you made a commitment to the Lord. A friend calls and said she needs $100 for medicine and she doesn't have it. What do you do? Do you help with the money that is the Lord's or not? In both those cases, I already know what I would do. Over the years, a few times, I've been ready to go into the pulpit to preach when someone in need contacted me. Once at Calvary Baptist Church in Kearney, Nebraska, the hospital called and said a young lady who had lost her baby said I was her pastor, and they were asking me to come to talk her into giving the baby up. When I got there, she was rocking in a rocking chair and hugging her child and would not give it up to the undertaker. When we talked and prayed, after a while, she gave the baby over. It was very sad, and yet those things are part of life, Christian or not. Another time, twice here at First Baptist Church on Sunday night, just before preaching, Barb Harris called and said Bill Bailey Bailey was dying, and if if I asked if I could come over and be with her and Betty. And then there was Nancy Simonetti. John, her husband, called as I was getting into the pulpit and said Nancy was near death and asked if I would come and be with them. Now, in all three of those cases, I not only have a responsibility to preach, but people are depending on me to preach. Besides, I'm getting paid to do that. In each case, I could have said I'll come after I get through preaching, but I didn't. I went. Here's my point. There is law, rules, and responsibility, and there is mercy, grace, and love. What I'm saying is, there are things that come along that at certain times are more important to do than attending church, giving, and preaching the gospel. And when those times come, you will have to decide which is right for you, to do or not do. For Jesus to sit back and do nothing because it was the Sabbath would not be good. Just so for you to not help someone in need because you think there's something greater to do would be sin. Love is greater than law. Remember for the priest, their most busy day was the Sabbath. Yet they were not condemned for working. Jesus also knew the hearts of those questioning him. These holy men were plotting to kill Jesus. The question had to sting them. So how do you think they responded? Look at Mark chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. And when he, Jesus, had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Jesus, how they might destroy him. That was their response. They were plotting how they might destroy the Son of God. How does Jesus respond to this criticism? And what does this response teach us about the heart of God? Jesus points to a scripture as precedent for his behavior. His response in Mark 2.25 is a reference again to the story in 1 Samuel about King David. His actions are defensible. Jesus says, because of the precedent of Scripture. And then he turns their criticism into a teaching on God's law. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the judge of the Sabbath. And the Pharisees, being tone deaf, said to Jesus, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Mark 2.25 But Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? 
He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. In the encounter in the synagogue, Jesus appears to appeals to Jewish interpretations of the law to show his actions are justified. Now listen, there are not too many times we read about Jesus being angry in the Bible. This is one of them. The anger was rooted in grief. Jesus was grieving the hardness of their hearts. They cared. These Pharisees cared more about rules than people. They had no heart for people. They were rooted in legalism and pride, both in his actions that bring criticism and in, and in his response, Jesus again teaches us something about our Heavenly Father. When Jesus encounters someone suffering, he doesn't use the Sabbath as an excuse not to help them. God made it clear that the law is summed up by the double commandments to love God with all our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In his actions in Mark chapter 2 and in chapter 3, Jesus shows us exactly what the love of God looks like. Here it is. Someone who loves the Lord by obeying, attending church on Sunday, Hebrews 10, 24, and yet is willing to forego, forego doing that to provide help for someone who is hungry or that needs assistance, takes precedence over going to church and worshiping the Lord. I want you to see this point. Let me end with this. It is good for our souls to remember that Jesus' ultimate response to criticism was entering into death. What was the criticism? Basically, the criticism was directed at God. And it's the criticism we are guilty of when, whenever we sin. It's our way of telling God that we think we know what's best for our life. And Jesus' response to that criticism was to enter this world take on flesh, live a life that doesn't criticize God through sin, and instead die on the cross so that we can be forgiven and live, live eternally with him. As Jesus hung on that cross, he declared forgiveness, which all of us here this morning desperately need. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. That's the ultimate response to criticism, forgiveness. The main point is that God, God loves people, and so should we. We are called to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that might mean going against what others think we should do in any particular situation. Now listen, God's laws are not to be used as an excuse to not show love for people and to not help them. This love plays into our salvation. Do you want to know if you are saved, if you are going to heaven when you die? Let me give you two scriptures. They both have to do with faith in Christ and love for him, for the brothers, not keeping 600 rules and regulations. <clears throat> 1 John 3.23 and this is his commandment, <clears throat> that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. When the New Testament talks about keeping God's commandments, these are the two it's talking about, believing in Jesus and loving others. 1 John 4, 23. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. <clears throat> That little word must is Greek, is the Greek word dia, and it means absolutely necessary. Here's how it reads. He who loves God <clears throat> must absolutely love his brother also. 
So the question is not, am I being obedient to God's Old Testament commands, but if I'm showing love to my brother. It's not if the society or the pastor or Christians around you will be happy if you do a certain thing, but are you showing love to your brother? And to have that kind of love, it starts with accepting Christ. It starts with repentance of sin and embracing Christ as as your Savior. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you'd like to pray and receive Christ, pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I ask Jesus to forgive me for all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. Hope to see you next Sunday with another sermon. What peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer